eat up half of that stuff. So, uh, but hey, before we get started, thank you guys. I just enjoy, one of the things you're going to notice, I have no slides. Um, this is all about telling a story. Before we get started, though, I've got to call somebody out here. So, <laughs> I'm going to tell the story. So, I was a state trooper here in Kansas. Well, one of my classmates comes, I didn't, re we haven't seen each other in probably, what, 25 years? Walks up to me, and so we get to talk, and he says, don't talk about me or I'll tell the story. So, I'm going to tell the story. You guys want to hear a real story about how I took out a radio? Yeah, so uh, this all started. I'll, I'll get into this, but it was so funny. Um, I got, I got, when I got on the state patrol, I got moved to Garden City, Kansas from Salina. So when we got on the academy, there was a guy from Garden City that they moved to Ottawa. Kip was in Ottawa, moved to Salina. I was in Salina. They moved me to Garden City. Great strategy the state of Kansas had. But my car gets damaged by my lieutenant during a storm, so I'm driving somebody else's car. I finally get to take my car back after staying up all night working a fatality hit and run. So I'm, you see, I'm already setting my excuses in motion here. So I'm setting the stage, right? So I'm headed up to uh, Topeka, Kansas to turn in this car, and it is a Sunday night, and I'm tired. I got like two hours of sleep, and I run a tag, and the tag comes back on a stolen vehicle. So what do I do? Hey, I call ahead. We've got a guy getting ready to stop the car. Well, we had 84 Plymouth Grand Furies, 318. They were so fast you could clock them with a calendar. I mean, they were just like, you know, really fast. Um, well, I was driving a mild out 81 Mercury or four, yeah, Mercury LTD, one of the sergeants had. Well, when you do felony stops, you pull your shotgun out and you slide around. I'm left, I shoot left-handed, I'm right-handed. I shoot left-handed, so you slide around. So you hit the lever to make the steering wheel go up on an 84 Plymouth. When you hit that lever, you know what it does on an 81 Mercury LTD? turns on the bright light. So the steering wheel didn't move. My shotgun hits the bottom of the steering wheel. I might have had my finger on the trigger. The shotgun goes off inside my patrol car, goes through the back seat, and takes out my radio. So when they open the car door, uh, we've got everybody stopped now. When they open the car door, I look like an episode of Cheech and Chong. There is smoke rolling out of the car. I am deaf as a post. I can't hear anything. And the sad part about it was the car was not stolen. It had been recovered. The Topeka Police Department, who I blame today for not doing this, forgot to take the tag or the car out of what's called NCIC of being stolen. So <clears throat> we went to training. <laughs> and Mr. Smartass here, <laughs> you guys remember the old tagline? Um, um, what was it, uh, Kansas, you know, or whatever it is like. But I had to write one of these letters. Dear Colonel, nobody was more surprised than me when my shot shotgun discharged accidentally. So I went to training, and these guys never let me hear the end of it. So I self-confess this so that Kip can't tell that story over lunch and embarrass all of you guys, right? So now that we got that out of the way, and I can see you guys are totally excited now, right? Want to hear what I have to say about S SpaceX. So anyway, getting that out of the way, let's talk a little bit about uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX. So that's the premise of the story. I'm gonna t that's, the, that's the top line, and I'm going to tell you three things. We're going to talk about three things as I talk about Elon Musk, and make sure I kind of stay in frame here. So... I'm going to talk to you about the solar winds, but I'm going to talk to you about it from the way an adversary looks at it. Then we're going to talk about Colonial Pipeline. And again, what was the sea change? What happened with Colonial Pipeline? Then I'm going to talk to you about the dark energy attack. How many of you guys remember when Russia took out uh, the power grid in western Ukraine, December 23, 2015, took out 700,000 homes, the first use of uh, um, the, I mean, black energy um, malware to take out industrial systems? You guys remember that? So we'll, we'll talk about that. So let's talk about Elon Musk for a minute. What many great, many great um, advances, great wealth is usually built by great ideas, right? So Elon Musk built a lot of wealth through some great ideas. One of them was SpaceX, right? What did Elon Musk do with SpaceX that nobody had ever done before? Sir. They reused the boosters. They reused the rockets. Because what? until then, what had happened before? Fall into the ocean, right? By the way, I am from, uh, grew up in Chapman, Kansas, home of Joe Engel, the second space shuttle astronaut. Uh, that's one of our claim to fames. Um, but that's what they did when they shot the space shuttle up. What happened to the solid rocket boosters? Just went back into the ocean. So what Elon did was he thought differently about the problem. He says, why can't we just reuse the rockets? So as we talk today about especially ransomware, because you just heard previous speaker, great stats, right? 20, over 20 billion in losses up from 11 and a half. I mean, you know, billion here, a billion there, pretty soon we're talking serious money, right? So what we're going to do is talk about how we can think differently about ransomware, because right now everybody uses the word respond, right? How do we respond to ransomware? How do we do incident response? 
What I want to do is change the terminology and say, how do we stop? Because I will tell you right now, who's faster, uh, machines or humans? Machines, not a trick question. Sorry, I, I'm not here to trick you this morning. I know you haven't all had your coffee. I went out and had a few brews at Rock and Brew. By the way, it's funny, too, because I spotted a table of four guys. I said they had to be cops. Went up and introduced myself. There were three military guys and one highway patrol guy. Um, so we got to talk. And so, again, not trick question because I'm not smart enough to do that first thing in the morning. So, but, yeah, so humans are not, humans were never designed to be the first line of defense on anything, especially when we talk about technology. Why? Because these attacks happen at machine speeds. Has anybody actually seen a demonstration of how fast ransomware can move throughout a system? Have you guys seen some of those demos? When they get in, how fast do you think, how fast do you think it takes, or how fast can it go once they get a foothold in your system? How fast can that ransomware spread inside a system and start encrypting files? Milliseconds, second, absolutely right. So if you had a model, um, if you had a model that says, hey, look, you can spend maybe a minute detecting it, 10 minutes figuring it out, and 60 minutes to respond, in that 60 minutes, what's happened to all your files inside your system? Would you guys buy a fire alarm if the only purpose of the fire alarm was to tell you that your house had successfully burned down? So we need to change our thinking, and that's one of the things I want to talk to you about is changing our thinking. One of the ways I changed my thinking, too, was... Um, and actually, I, I got a credit, too. We had a great time at the Patrol Academy. I mean, but when we got out of the Academy, we had a Smith & Wesson 686. We had ammo dumps. We didn't even have speed loaders. And a ra no handheld radio, just a radio in our car. We had nothing, so we had to rely. We didn't have all the extra technology. So when you're the only guy out sometimes for six counties, you got to be creative, especially when the guy you're wanting to arrest is like twice your size. So you have to be good at talking your way out of stuff, which got me into the interview and interrogation. So one of the things I did... I specialized in behavior analysis. I actually got to go through the training put on by the original members of the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit. Why? Because I love the way people think. I ended up instructing and teaching behavior analysis out at the National Security Agency to damage assessment agents that came out of cases like Alder James, Earl Edwin Pitts, Harold James Nicholson, um, uh, folks like that. And what was so unique about that is a lot of these agents relied too much on the polygraph. They relied too much on the machines, and they didn't realize the human behavior. Because one thing hostile intelligence services are very good at is figuring out where the weakness is in your system. See, we build systems based on the way we think we ought to defend against it, right? But how do bad guys, bad actors, look at the system? They look at it through their eyes. When you go into a bank, are the most effective bank controls, you know, and to prevent robberies and prevent, you know, by the way, more theft happens from... Uh, internal theft than it does from bank robbery. So when you go into a bank, where are you going to see most cameras pointed? At the tellers, right? But the most effective deterrence to bank robberies, do you think they're invented by some corporate weenie sitting in an office with a white shirt and a tie? Or do you think they're invented by the people who actually used to rob banks? Not a trick question. <laughs> they're invented by the people who used to rob banks. Why? Because us sitting here, we think we, we build stuff based upon the way we perceive the problem. Not the way our adversaries perceive the problem. So what I'm going to walk you through today is the biggest flaw is usually not in how we put things together the big, and solve problems. Our biggest flaw is the way we think about solving the problem. That's what our adversaries exploit. And I'll give you a quick example. So let's talk about solar winds. One of the big things that happened with solar winds is that it, it took advantage of our just... Um, inordinate amount of trust did we place in an update that should have been untrusted, right? How many of you folks actually, uh, when you get an update from Microsoft or Cisco, or whoever you get it from, actually send it to your team, they reverse engineer it, decompile it, look for malware in it, put it back together and send the update out, right? Anybody do that on a regular basis? No, right? What do you do? So, we, so you, inherently then, you guys trust the update that comes in, don't you? And when you trust that update, you kind of trust it, right? So when you bring it in, what do you do with that update? You put it into a sandbox, right? So we put it into the sandbox going, well, guess what? I'll put it into the sandbox for three days, right? And if nothing bad happens in three days, guess what we'll do? What do we do? We push it into the production environment, right? So what's the flaw in that thinking? Not a trick question. Yeah, there's, there's no time delay built in. So what happens is when you get, when, so, I'm, so uh, one of the, uh, 
let's say organizations I used to have a special interest in when I was at the State Department um, as an advisor doing work for them and some other things was Russian military intelligence, GRU. Russia has been at this game for a long time. The original intelligence organization was created uh, by Russia during World War I. I mean, the first major one. Britain kind of had one, but Russia really instituted the first intelligence organization. It's called the V-Cheka. Then it became the NKVD, a couple of uh, uh, variations. Then it became the KGB, and then it split up after the failed uh, coup against Gorbachev into the FSB and SVR. I tell you that for a reason right now, because that's going to become important in the third story we talk about. But the reason I'm telling it you now is they have been at this game for a long time. So when we had the election... Um, issues, the, what they call malign influence operations during the 2016 election, of course Facebook was not going to get this. Of course Twitter was not going to get this. You know why? Because we had a bunch of 30-somethings going against people who had spent 117 years or, you know, th 10 years at this point thinking about how to defeat an adversary. So here's what Russia did. Solar Winds, and I'm not picking on the company because it could have been any companies. We found out later with Pulse Secure, the VPN, you can attack a lot of companies. What they did was they said, if we can just, if we, we looked at them, and so their uh, software was network management software. So if you install network management software, what does that software have access to? Everything, right? You are now trusting something to put into your environment that you don't, that you just trust the company, but can you trust the software, right? So you put this into your environment, it has access to everything. It's like traditional antivirus, right? If you put antivirus on your system, it has to have access to what? Everything, all your files. This is how they got the tool set um, uh, from the NSA contractor that was exploited by the shadow brokers. Came in through Kaspersky. You went into their sandbox, they isolated it. So come back to this case. So what all Russia did was they looked at it and they said, so if we can get into SolarWinds, which, by the way, was easy. SolarWinds is not, was not a tough company to get into. They're much tougher now, but if a determined adversary wants to get into you, they'll find a way. So they got into SolarWinds. They got into their update server. And the first thing they did was test it out. They put a small piece of malign, or just a, a non-malicious code, just benign code in there. And they sent it out, because guess what they're checking for? Will anybody detect it? Will anybody detect this? Nobody detected it. So then they started putting the full package in there. One of the things they did to exploit the way we thought about the problem is the way we thought about the problem was we thought it would be totally safe if we put it into the sandbox for three days and nothing happens, we push it in our production environment. That's a good process. All they did was look for the flaw in the process. The flaw in the process was if I just wait 10 days or 12 days before I activate, I can now bypass all of your security controls, all of the processes you have in place because the minute you put it into your production environment, you what? You trust it. You trust it to operate. So all it did was wait 10 days and go, Combat, pop up its periscope, look around, go, looks good. It looked for certain products. If it found certain products, it actually had mechanisms in there to tamper with those products and shut them off so they wouldn't detect it. And then it would activate. So what happens is that they ran an intelligence operation for several months. They got what they needed. The purpose of this was not to just breach a system. The purpose of this was to collect information. Any former military people here? Which branch? Hua. All right. Anybody else? What branch? I thought you said you were in the military. Yeah, no, sorry, just kidding. Oh, ho, ho. yes, ma'am. Navy. All right. You guys gave Marines lots of rides. They appreciated it. That's what they told me. Uh, I heard one time the only good Marines is a submarine. Yes, ma'am. Navy. All right. You guys should get together and talk. I'll tell you, who had the best chow halls? Air Force. Yeah, everybody knows that one, right? When they say you sleep under the stars, Air Force rates their hotels by five stars. You know, the, the, the Marines and Air Army, yeah, we see the stars. Anyway, now the, the reason I say that is that, um, so what they did, it, this is called IPB, Intelligence Preparation of the Battlefield. Their purpose was not to launch an attack right then. Their purpose was to collect information and intelligence on our capabilities. One of the agents they hit was like the nu National Nuclear Stockpile. What are they collect? Belief. So a lot of people think, well, they hit the unclassified systems. Yeah, let me tell you something. Having been in Washington for in the Washington area for a long time, Northern Virginia, having held pretty good high-level security clearances. Uh, if you guys have held those before, TSSCI, things like that. What you realize is that a lot of the information is not classified. It's the analysis of the information that's classified and the systems that it comes from. So how much information do you think they got out of unclassified systems? They got a ton on our energy grid, on our national nuclear stockpile. This attack, this breach was designed to collect information and intelligence to be used in a future conflict. 
And so Russia is doing what we call IPB, intelligence preparation of the battlefield. All they, all they did, the only thing they did to make this successful was figure out what is it we trust that we shouldn't trust, but we trust because of a thing called transitive trust. If A trusts B and B trusts C, then A can trust C. They exploited the flaw in that thinking. And the flaw in that thinking was we trusted the update. If you didn't trust the update, then why would you install it? How many of you folks here, uh, what is it, Microsoft puts out their patches, what, every Wednesday? Tuesdays? Yeah. Uh, anyway, but how many of you guys, when you get the, I, I'm a Mac guy, but how many of you guys, when you get the patches, what do you automatically do? Install it. Um, I used to teach computer crime investigation. A couple of my students were FBI agents, the ones that actually ended up catching Kevin Mitnick. Kevin was very good at doing something. How many of you guys are old enough to remember the days of Novell? And how many of you guys would get those diskettes in the mail that are shrink wrapped and you go, oh, it's an update? What's a, you're not, what was the first thing you did? Broke the shrink wrapped and installed it, right? So, one of the things that Kevin was good at, he actually got the software before it was delivered. He put his back door into the software, shrink wrapped it again, and then had it delivered to you in his UPS uniform to make it look like it was UPS delivering it. So when you found a backdoor in the system, you would find a flaw in it. What, what's the first thing you would go do? Go back and get your, quote, trusted software, reinstall the operating system, and what would you automatically do? Reinstall the backdoor again. Because you thought you could trust the software, because it, you thought it came from Novell, and you thought it was trusted because it was shrink-wrapped. What I'm trying to get to you here is that what our adversaries are doing, as it gets harder and harder to get past some of the initial defenses, they're going to zero-day exploits. But guess what? I will still go after humans any chance I get. What's the easiest way to get into a system? Through the humans, right? Phishing and spear phishing is still the number one tactic of hostile intelligence agencies. So uh, that, so when I talk about solar winds, that's gonna, we're gonna use, we're gonna talk about that in the third example, um, talking about Ukraine. But when we talk about solar winds, the big C change there was the fact is that no matter how good you were, no matter how good of a, everybody thinks they've got great controls and great processes. How many of you guys stand up in front of your boss and go, you know, our controls pretty much suck, our processes probably need a lot of work, you know, and I should probably be fired. Has anybody ever, <laughs> you, <laughs> you're fired. That's your career. <laughs> you're, you're that guy. Uh, who do you work for? I uh, see now you're hesitant. <laughs> uh, okay, let me see. Call your boss. No, all right. Siri, where, who does this guy work for? Um, no, but, but the point I'm getting at is that nobody stands up and do that. Everybody says they've got great processes, but, I'm, but what happens is the processes are designed by people who think it's great. Nobody calls. How many of you guys have gone out and called your own kid ugly? Right? Nobody calls the baby ugly. Nobody, nobody has the, I would say, the intestinal fortitude to really sit back a lot of times and challenge conver conventional wisdom and proverbial thinking inside meetings. But you have to do that if you really want to get effective security because the problem isn't the problem the way you see it. The problem is the problem the way your adversary sees it. And if you're solving for your problem and not their problem, you're going to fail. In fact, Sun Tzu said it best. He said, if you know yourself but you don't know your enemy, for every victory you will have a defeat. Uh, if you know uh, yourself and the enemy, then you will have nothing to fear in 100 battles. But if you know neither yourself nor the enemy, then every result will be disastrous. And all I'm saying is here, you've got to understand your adversary. You, you think you're smart at what you do, but I'm telling you, that it's not that they're smarter than you, it's that they think differently about the problem than you do. How many space agencies were thinking about reusing rockets until Elon Musk finally said, Let's just reuse the solid rocket boosters. Let's make those things land. How cool is it to see a rocket that goes up, launches an orbiter, and then comes back down to a launching pad? Now, did it fail sometimes? Sure. But how many failures did we have in the Apollo space program, in the Mercury program? How many failures does China and Russia have? They, they all, everybody has failures. But he was willing to take the risk and think differently. So that's kind of solar winds. The reason I laid that out there is because I listened to the Senate Intelligence Committee hearings, uh, chaired by Mark Warner, uh, the ranking member is Marco Rubio. And when uh, Kim was talking earlier, uh, whether I do Fox News, I look, I've, I'm, I'm an analyst, not a contributor, so I'm not paid by anybody, but I've been on every network. I mean, CNN, ABC, you name it. I do a lot of stuff for Fox and Fox Business, just because that's the way it works out. But I talk about ones and zeros, not R's and D's. You know, I, I don't talk political stuff. I have, a, I have a bitch with every single administration about how they handled stuff. Anybody here, anybody here have a security clearance that was part of the OPM breach? 
Yours truly did too, right? So your information, you know how, you know how those, you know how many of those high level findings went across how many different administrations? It crossed every administration. R or D, it does, do you think our adversaries really care who's in office? No. Their goal is to gain an edge for them, regardless of who's in office. So they don't care about R's or D's. What they concentrate on is ones and zeros. So let's talk about Colonial. Colonial Pipeline also, too, was another one of those things to where the, what is the one enduring image that comes out of the Colonial Pipeline breach that you guys remember? The one image. How many of you guys remember the image, the video of that lady pouring gasoline into a plastic shopping bag? And that was over a perceived gas shortage, not a real one. And that is the first time the United States has actually seen what it would be like if somebody really attacked our critical infrastructure and took it out. Because all they did was attack the IT system, not the OT system. They didn't get into the industrial control side. But the reason they were able to shut it down, imagine going showing up to Walmart one day and the store is closed, the doors are locked, you can't get in, but all the products there, but they can't operate because they can't bill anybody, they can't ring up sales. That's the same as shutting down their operational system. You think, you think that um, Colonial Pipeline was going to send out hundreds of millions of fuel and not be able to track where it went and be able to bill for it? So they were able to actually effectively shut them down from operating and the way they got into it was an unused VPN account that was not shut off. And where did they get the password from? It was a reused password found in a data breach that was leaked on the dark net. Dark web, I mean. By the way, here's a piece of trivia. Who invented the, uh, who invented the dark web? The Naval Research Laboratory. The Naval Research Laboratory created the first onion routing network called the Tor network so that our people and our military folks could communicate securely and it was used for human rights activists and people like that. So the actual dark web was actually invented by the Naval Research Laboratory. It was monetized by bad guys and it became viable when what got introduced onto the dark web? Bitcoin. Bitcoin was the first way to now anonymously transact, you think anonymous, right? Transact uh, things on the dark web and Silk Road was one of the first big uh, marketplaces that was out there. Drugs, explosive, guns, you name it, Silk Web had it all. So they thought differently about the problem. So how does that get back into Colonial Pipeline? Because one VPN account that should have been shut off with a password that was reused, that was found in a data breach, all somebody did was do a little bit of hard work and get in, and when they got the ransomware inside Colonial, how long did it take before they shut down? Pretty quick. I mean, a matter of hours, they realized they had a huge problem. This is part of our critical infrastructure. There was an Air Force Israeli general who used to work for Netanyahu, and he had a saying that says, if you want to bring a civilization, civilization to its knees, you go after two things, power and water. And I would add a third thing, you go after food. Being from Kansas, originally, I don't, I'm a Kansas farm boy, grew up in a little town called Chapman, went to Fort Hayes State, go Tigers. Um, you know, I grew up in a farming community, right? If you want to go after, if you go after power, water, and food, if you can bring, and this is going to factor in again to the third story, so I'm building as we go here. So this is going to factor into the third story with Ukraine. If I can go after power, water, and food, what can I do to a civilization? Can I, you think I can throw them into chaos? Once you put a civilization into chaos, it takes fewer people as an occupying force to come in and take over. If you're, if you're in disarray, if, you've, you know, if you're going all over the place, why do you think Russia was able to annex Crimea the way they did? Because they had their own agent provocateurs, they had their own people in there causing problems, they threw it into chaos, and then Russia was able to come in before Ukraine could even respond and annex Crimea. And this is how Russia, when I talk about the third one, this is how Russia will take over Ukraine. Uh, I'm predicting that Russia will be able to invade Ukraine and take them over without firing a shot, if they choose to. Maybe something will stop them, we'll see. So, but Colonial Pipeline. So imagine what would happen if we actually had a real attack on our power grid. Imagine what would happen if we had a real attack on, a, on our fuel system. I, 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 mean, I flew out here, direct flight, you know, to, from uh, Dulles Airport to Kansas City. You know, everything's kind of back to normal, right? But when the price goes up, who pays the price? We do as consumers, right? Do you think that they, do you think they take the cost of that attack? No. It's passed along to the consumers, which passed along to the fuel suppliers, passed along to the airlines, passed along to the passengers. So at the end of the day, we pay for somebody's 
uh, inability to defend their own critical infrastructure. And here's what happened in Colonial too. Um, as I was talking about the Senate Intelligence Committee hearing, it's the first time I've actually seen senators actually ask good questions. I've been the victim of this. I've, I've been in front of when Kim was talking. I did testify on healthcare.gov. I will tell you, members of Congress, um, they don't write. The, most of them do not write their own questions, and they have staffers write it, which means they don't understand the question. They don't understand the answer. So we were getting a lot of questions that made absolutely no sense. They've gotten better at it now. They've gotten better to the point the Senate people have gotten better. They asked really good questions, and this was one of the few times where I saw um, um, uh, th this was bipartisan. Republicans and Democrats had serious issues about the way we were responding and defending our critical infrastructure. So th these are lessons that we're learning, but again, what did they exploit? Exploited poor controls, exploited, and by the way, too, they got four and a half million out of this thing, and they were able to claw some of that back because, believe it or not, Bitcoin is not truly anonymous. You know, the Internet has a return address, right? If you send an email and you want to reply, it has to know where to send it, right? So even if you send a request and you say, hey, you've got to send me Bitcoin, it still has to know where to send it. They had poor trade craft. Uh, they were able to actually um, find a hole in their trade craft, their operational security, and actually be able to claw some of that back. And it was funny. The CEO of Colonial says, you know, now that we've recovered some of that money, I think we're going to spend a couple million on cybersecurity. And I'm going, Skippy, if you just spent a million before this, you never would have made the news. Right, so we, we um, as the government used to say, we never seem to have enough time and money to do it right, but we always seem to find the time and money to do it over. And when you do it over, if it costs one dollar, this is actually IBM did this study. If it costs one dollar to solve the problem before you launch the product, how much does it cost to solve that same problem after you launch the product? One hundred dollars. So you, we think about that. So why do I tell you that story to lead you up into the third story? And the third story I want to talk to you about is this attack. And this gets into thinking about our adversaries. We think we're so smart, but our adversaries, are it's not that they're smarter, it's that they think differently about the problem than we do. So here's what happened in the uh, attack against the Zaporizhia hydroelectric plant in western Ukraine that's on the Dnieper River. And why do I be so specific about this? Because in 1941, Hitler launched uh, a campaign against Russia. and does anybody, for a free cookie uh, that I will buy for you uh, in the snack room, anybody remember the name of that operation? Operation Barbarossa. It was Hitler's plan to invade Russia. Well, so Stalin, to prevent the German army from encroaching into Ukraine, one of the things they sent was their NKVD, NKVD to Kiev and western Ukraine to blow up the same dam that they would attack on December 23rd, 2015, the Zaporizhia hydroelectric plant that sits on the Dnieper River was the same dam that Russia blew up in 1941 that killed over 100,000 Ukrainians. And this is one of those facts from history a lot of people don't realize. Russia has a sense of history. So when we talk about, and I'm pick, kind of picking on Russia because that was one of my areas I focused on, but China's the same way too. They have a long sense of history. But the attack was on December 23rd, 2015. Why is that? So I look at it different. I say, why is that date important? Russia, how many of you guys saw the movie Top Gun? Remember that scene with Fred Thompson as the captain? He goes, son, the Russians don't take a steamy dump without a plan. Right? There's, I'm telling you, that was the line of my said. So what is so, what is so important about December 23rd, 2015? Well, on December 23rd, 2014, Ukraine parliament held a vote, and they voted 333 to 80, I think it was, to change their status from a non-aligned nation to an aligned nation. You have to be an aligned nation to join NATO. And what does Russia not want on their southern border? Is a NATO country because an attack, well, it used to be an attack on one NATO country is an attack on all according to the NATO doctrine, right? So exactly one year later, they launched this attack. How did they launch this attack? They launched it by social engineering. They sent a spoofed email that appeared to come from a member of the Ukrainian car parliament it laid out all of the stuff. They used fear, manipulation, influence, and deceit to be able to get this person to open up the spreadsheet. And in that spreadsheet, it said, to view the contents of this, enable macros. What do you not do in a spreadsheet? They enabled macros. All it took was that one thing, and Russia spent six months undetected inside their systems, harvesting information, harvesting the credentials for the VPN to the SCADA system. The other thing they also got access to 
was the Windows Domain Controller. I'm not, I'm, I'm not the most technical guy, but I kind of figured out if I have access to the Windows Domain Controller, I'm God inside that system, right? I have access to everything. So they designed very specific, it was called operation-specific malware, and it was designed to attack the firmware that connected the serial to Ethernet connectors on the breakers to the control system because some of these systems were old. You had to create these cables serial to Ethernet so you could connect the system. What they did was they scanned, they looked, they implemented their malware, and then the time came, December 23rd, 2015, exactly one year to the date after uh, Ukraine had the uh, temerity to say that they're going to join NATO and Russia launched their attack. And the first thing they did is they started taking the access to the systems offline. The engineers were sitting there at their desk watching the mouse move across their screen, and there's nothing they could do about it. it they, they locked them out, changed their password. Then they went into the uh, industrial control system, and they started shutting off all the breakers and started taking off power. And they're going, that's okay. We got backup systems. What did Russia get into as well? That got into the backup system. So the failover system also failed. Um, they also launched a denial of service attack against the phone system to make it harder to communicate, harder to solve. Um, the other thing they did, too, was drop a little uh, ransomware into the mix as well, too. That's not as well known. But uh, I'm going to talk to you about something in a second uh, about the way Russia thinks about doing this, and you'll understand why I worry about more about our inability to define the problem correctly than I do our adversaries. So they were able to do this. They were able to take off 700,000 homes, take off the backup, take off the three plants and two backup power plants, take off the uh, backup, uh, backup generators, run everything dark. And the one thing they did that made it difficult to recover from this is it was called operation-specific malware. They actually created malware that was designed to attack the firmware and the cables. So once it got rid of that, once it destroyed that firmware, basically, what's the only way to fix that problem? You got to physically replace the cables. This is not something you can do remote. So they extended the impact of the attack by making you now have to physically go out and change cables to be able to restore your systems again. And that just extended the impact of the attack. So when we look at this, the way, again, we define problems the way we think the world is. Folks, that's not, you take the world as you find it, not as you wish it was. And the problem is, is their, our problems are not their problems and how they view them. So I go back to Einstein, what Einstein said. He said, if I had an hour to save the world and my life depended upon ask, a, answering a single question, I would spend the first 55 minutes really defining the problem and asking the right question and then five minutes solving it. But how many of you guys, when you get into the office on Monday, and I know, Kip, with stuff you do for the federal government, you get in Monday, and what's your inbox look like? What do we do on Mondays? Me? I ignore. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not in that position anymore. Unless the world's on fire and if there's a nuclear bomb headed towards, uh, you know, Virginia, and then if there is, there's not much I can do about it. So I don't worry about it. Uh, I used to have to worry about stuff, but I don't have to worry about that. But you guys come in Monday. What do you do when you look at your inbox? You plow through it, right? You, you work through it, and that's, that's because that's what we do, and that's what they take advantage of. This email was sent during a time for Ukraine to where they were getting a bunch of emails and they're having to work through it. They use fear, manipulation, influence, and deceit to get the person to open up the email. And, what, and the faster you go, the chances are you're going to make a mistake, right? So there's an old special operator saying, anybody been in special forces, the slow is smooth, smooth is fast. You've got to slow down and take a breath. How many of you guys have ever gotten rich by clicking a link in an email from a Nigerian prince that says, I got $5 million for you, right? Just doesn't happen. You got to take a breath. We all recognize that what we don't recognize is a second level, third level of sophistication that's designed to attack our preconceptions. So let's talk a little bit then about, here's the way I think it's going to look in the future. And this is how, uh, I'll give you an idea about how future conflict will be hybrid warfare. It will be cyber warfare along with kinetic warfare, and they will launch the cyber strike first before they launch the kinetic side uh, second. And one of the ways they're going to do this, so I, I do a keynote called Cyber Strike, Warfare in the Fifth Domain. There's five domains of war now, sea, air, land, space, and cyberspace. And the Air Force actually has, um, uh, they're the lead in cyberspace activities. Um, and so in this scenario, and I was worried that I was maybe going out on a ledge on this scenario until I had a couple guys, from one from FBI and one from, from Homeland Security Investigations come up and says, how'd you know that? Well, what I proposed in this scenario was the way that you would get into a system. How many of you guys go out um, to Office Depot or Best Buy or have office supplies shipped into you and you guys have inkjet cartridges? 
for your inkjet printers, right? There are firms in the Northern Virginia whose only job is when those things come in, they hire college kids or, you know, people need jobs over the summer, take a pair of needle nose pliers and break the chips off of all of those things. Because how many times have you put in a cartridge and it says, congratulations, genuine HP cartridge, right? How does it know that? It knows that because of that little chip that's on your inkjet cartridge. And if I can put that on there, what else can I put on there? And how many people actually take their inkjet cartridges before they deploy them into their in production network and actually analyze the contents of the chip to make sure there's nothing on there? See, you're laughing, ma'am. You're laughing. You know. You know. We, we, we just assume, hey, look, it's an office supply. It should be safe, right? There's a flaw in our thinking. So fight. Does this actually happened, believe it or not. This is an actual attack vector that happened. They actually put code on an inkjet printer. Boom, and because it beaconed out, we're able to determine where their inkjet printers were, and we're able to successfully, um, in an operation I may or may not be aware of, uh, but somebody was able to maybe send some missiles into a place. Why? Because the inkjet cartridge beaconed where the printer was, and the printers were of a specific make, and they knew that they were assigned to this specific unit, so that's the one they wanted to bomb. All because of an inkjet cartridge. So here's, so here's the scenario I built for them. If I, were, if I were Russian agro and invade Ukraine, one of the ways I would do is I would start about two years earlier. And one of the things I would do is I would find somebody. Uh, let's pick on you, sir. What's your name? Eric? Derek. Your name's Eric now. No, Derek. All right, Derek. So Citizen Derek works. Uh, he is in Russia, and he has a member of uh, the Russian intelligence service. Let's say... Uh, SVR, which is their external uh, intelligence service. And he comes up and says, uh, Citizen Derek, you know, we have something we want you to do for us. We have a comrade Derek who looks a lot like Citizen Derek. And so we put comrade Derek through a little bit of plastic surgery and change his features enough, give him time to heal. And then what I do is I send the real Citizen Derek in to go apply for a position at the National Bank of Ukraine. So Citizen Derek, when they check his fingerprints, when they check his criminal history, they're getting the real citizen, right? They're getting the real person. So what are the chances, after he goes to work for them, that somebody knows him so well that they would be able to identify that it's not Comrade Derek coming in to take his place? So I was at the New York State Police uh, Intelligence Conference, speaking to the New York State Police. Uh, there's a, an obvious... Uh, conclusion. So I was speaking to them and I simply asked them, I said, when these guys come back in, I said, after this, do you guys actually fingerprint your folks when they come into the academy? Because New York State, I mean, when we got hired, Kip, there was what, 16 in our class? It was pretty easy. They all knew us. I mean, we were a small organization, but when you're hiring two or 300 and you maybe are from California, what are the chances that somebody there knows somebody know well that they can tell that it's not the same Derek that they talked to because they don't check their fingerprints. They trust that the person showing up is the same person they check because they asked, let me see your ID. Okay, great. Well, if I've got an ID that looks like him, all I do is I give Citizens Derek's ID to Comrade Derek, and he passes for him, right? So when they started doing that, guess what? Out of the next class, they found three people that went out and did things that would prevent them from becoming law enforcement officers in the state of New York simply because they fingerprinted them and checked them again before they came to the academy. I said, you gotta, how do you know that the person you hired is the person showing up? So when I did this, we had some guys come up later and says, how did you know that? I said, well, thank you. They said, for what? I said, for asking that question, because that means that you're aware of something. I was just doing a Tom Clancy. I just did some research, and I said, if I were going to do this, this is how I would do it. And they, ver they validated something that has actually happened, and they've actually put people in position by having them impersonate real people. So the only reason I tell you that story is because they're thinking differently about it, right? So you, you take the inkjet cartridge, you take the people, if I want to extend a ransomware attack, uh, have you guys ever seen the little videos? It's these things called USB killers. You're laughing. <laughs> have you done that? You, yeah, I can either confirm or deny that I've done that. You know, <laughs> funny you should ask. So USB killers, all they are—they're not a USB; they're a capacitor, and they—they they have a stored energy charge inside there. And you simply take them, and if you plug them into a USB port, like say on a laptop, what does it do to that laptop? Fries it. So I live in Loudoun County, Virginia. Um, does anybody know what Loudoun County, Virginia is famous for besides all the school board stuff that's going on? 80% um, of the world's internet traffic goes through Loudoun County. We have more data centers in Loudoun County per square inch than I think any place on the planet. What kind of havoc could I create if I had a comrade Derek impersonating a citizen Derek walk through a data center that has a ton of USB ports and simply just start plugging in USB killers? 
How many of you guys, I went to the RSA security show, uh, and actually some of the guys I trained out at NSA were there, and they were, as your son doing, that's great. So they say, hey, you know, and I say, hey, would you guys like, you know, at the Sentinel One booth, we've got some cables, you know, so you plug in the USB cables, we've got chargers. So the NSA is handing these things out. I'm <laughs> going, what the hell? I mean, you're the NSA. I'm not taking anything from the NSA and plugging it into my computer. Then I walk around the corner, and here's this Chinese firm offering me a USB drive with all their marketing material on it. I'm going, who does your marketing people? Are you guys tone deaf? You know, so all I'm, all I'm saying is that no matter how much you think humans could defend against something, they can't. Google and the University of Chicago proved this out. They took 100 USBs, loaded them with beaconing software, and they just threw them around the campus. How many of those USBs do you think got plugged into systems? 80%. How many does it take? One. If this was press right, I'm sorry, sir, you would have went over. You said 90. It was actually 80. So you don't win. You have to come closest to the prize without going over. I'm sorry. Those, those are the rules. I don't make them up. So that's, that's what you have to do. So all I'm saying is that if you guys think, as you guys start thinking about your problems, don't think about the way that you would implement a control. I would think about once you put a control in place, I would think about if I implement this control, what would be the easiest way to bypass it? Because one of the easiest ways to get by stuff, I've, I've watched Office Space. You know, I saw the guys write the software. Uh, you know, to, to collect, it's called the salami approach. You know, you just take a fraction of a cent, you compile it up over time, and pretty soon you can get a lot of money. You know, I've seen what, I, can see, I see what insiders do. That's why we're so concerned uh, from a defense standpoint or an intelligence standpoint. Insiders can do so much damage. Aldra James got dozens of people killed. Robert Hansen got people killed. Um, you, you know, we can just go on and on about what insiders can do. And the insiders, they are inside the system, and if they're good at what they do, and especially if they get the help from their adversaries, they understand where our flaws are, where our weaknesses are, and where our blind spots are, and that's what they go attack. So all I'm saying to you is that if, when you go back to your companies and you go back to your environment, do a couple things. Number one, don't take anything for gospel. Um, I run a podcast right now called Game of Crimes. I, of course, I had to get a gratuitous plug in there. Um, but my buddy on this, how many of you guys have seen Narcos on Netflix, the takedown of Pablo Escobar? That's my partner on this. This is the real Steve Murphy. And Steve Murphy's parents, actually, he's related to the original Hatfield and McCoys. It's just like his great, great, great grandfather or something. These guys fought for years. Does anybody know why? Because it's the way we always did it, you know? They, it finally took a peace deal to finally settle the Hatfield and McCoy feud because that's the way we've always done it. The biggest mistake you can do when you're in a corporation and you're in an environment, whether it's public sector, government, whatever else, is to accept something as gospel. You should always challenge, and I'm saying this in a good way, challenge authority, challenge proverbial, uh, proverbial wisdom, challenge conventional thinking, and say, why are we doing it this way? Does anybody know why the solid rocket boosters for the space shuttle are the width they are? Sir? Well, the, you're right, but why are the tunnels that wide? Are you been, you've been are you on my computer? I swear I'm going to need some ID. That's what was the width of a what was the width of a Roman chariot? Two horses wide. What's the width of a train track today? About two horses wide. The reason the solid rocket boosters are the size they are is because they have to be carried on train tracks, and train tracks were built based on the fact is that a Roman chariot was two horses wide, and that's where everything started from. There's examples when you go back and listen to people talk about their grandma and grandpa. This one lady was making this meatloaf or whatever, and when she got done, she would cut one side, then the other, then the other, and the other. She says, why do you do that? She says, well, that's how my grandma did it. Well, let's go ask grandma why she did it. She says, I don't know why you guys are doing this. The reason we did it back then is that's the only way it would fit into the very small baking pan we had. That's the only reason we did it, right? If you don't spend the time and go back and understand why you're doing something, this is where your adversaries are going to exploit the flaw in your thinking. They're going to find out what you've been doing forever, and find a way to exploit it. How many people had been forever putting software into a sandbox for three days, looking at it, and as long as nothing bad happened, they would put it into the production environment? How long have we been doing that? We've been doing that until what happened? Not a, not a trick question again. Solar winds, right? After solar winds, how many of you guys changed your, uh, don't raise your hands because I don't need to know confidential information. Just slide it to me on a card later. Um, how many of you guys, though, changed your policies about what you did with Sandbox? 
and how you looked at updates and the things that you did and anti-tampering, all of those things, right? So all it takes is one event to change the way we think about this. So what I want to do is allow a little bit of time if you guys want questions, or we can talk about a couple other things, um, uh, like some of the latest exploits. But it's to challenge the way you think about the problem. The problems of today cannot be solved at the same level of thinking at which they were created. Another great Albert Einstein quote. If you look at the problem through your eyes as it is today, you will not win the battle against the adversary. Why? Because the adversary is not looking at what you're thinking about today. They're thinking about what am I going to do tomorrow to get into your system. So when solar winds, the operation was winding down by the Russian intelligence, how far into their planning do you think they were on the next operation? They're already several months into the next campaign that they were going to run. They were already identifying the next set of vulnerabilities. China did that with the Office 365. How many of you guys in here trust two-factor authentication? I don't see a lot of hands go up, right? Well, you kind of trust it. I mean, you trust it, right? We use it a lot. But what's one of the novel things they did to exploit our trust, like with Outlook, uh, uh, the Access Outlook Web Access, I think it was, right? Because you can only get into it. If you've used two-factor authentication and somebody sets a secure cookie that says, oh, I trust this computer, right? All they did was figure out a way to replicate that secure cookie so they can get into the system pretending that they'd already used two-factor authentication to get in there. How many of you folks, if you use a VPN, trust that the VPN is a secure tunnel between where you are and where you want to go? We did that until Pulse Secure. We understood what happened with that VPN, right? So does that mean you have to get paranoid and you can't trust anything? No, all it means is that you just can't rely on one thing. Just like with anything else, you layer your defenses, you layer things, right? You, what you want to do is you want, I want to change your terminology. I, I'm tired of responding to stuff. I want to stop things. And one of the ways you stop things is that you raise the price of an attack to such a point is that you extract an extreme economic price out of the attacker and make it difficult to get in. And one of the ways you do that, let's take a look at a bank, right? It's kind of easy to walk in and get some of the money, right? But if you want to get into the safe um, that's locked and closed, right? It's kind of hard to get into, right? Yeah, wrong. If I want to get into the safe, who do I go after? The person who has the combination. And you guys have seen this in movies, right? But it's real life. If I want to get you to open up the vault, what do I go after? I go after something that's important to you, and I threaten what's important to you to get you open. I don't have to drill through the bank. And the other thing, too, is when you come in and do it, because you have the credentials, the system trusts you. They think, ah, oh, you're supposed to be here. So what we've got to do is start thinking differently about the problem. For example, Kip here, my buddy from the patrol. Let's say Kip is by contract, by schedule, whatever. He's a Monday through Five guy. At Friday at 5 o'clock, he has to log out of the system, shut down access, because that's the way the agency works. You know, you know access after 5 o'clock. Or, and that's when his contract, you know, he does 40 hours a week and that's it, goes home, right? So if Kip's logging in on a Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock with the credentials, with his username, password, and it looks like multi-factor authentication, the system looks at it and goes, oh, that's Kip. You know, that's fine. You know, I trust him because he's got the credentials. The system should be looking at what is Kip's behavior. It's not what he's doing. It's what is Kip's behavior. And when's the last time Kip actually logged in on a Saturday? And by the way, do I know enough about what Kip does to understand is that Kip should not be logging in on a Saturday because he is a contract employee that only has access to the facility Monday through Friday. So anything after Friday at 5 o'clock, we should stop, right? The way ransomware works is if I have a trusted account and a trusted access and I get into the account initially, it, the system thinks, hey, you're trusted. I'm supposed to be in there. Derek's a trusted guy. I'm supposed to be in there until what happens, until the malware starts spreading. By then it's too late. Again, that's the fire alarm that tells you your house is successfully burned down. No need for the fire department at this point. We just need a builder. We've got to rebuild your house. What we want to do is start looking at behavior, and that's the role of artificial intelligence, machine learning, things like that, is that uh, a machine speed attack needs a machine speed response. You, in, in this day and age, the number of attacks are transitioning now from exploits of humans to exploits of zero days. Have you folks been tracking what's been going on with the iPhone update and the NSO and the Pegasus software? So NSO is an Israeli firm um, that's got this Pegasus software, and it's designed to exploit zero-day exploits in the iPhone, and especially the Safari, the mobile browser. And that was their key thing. One of the unique things they did was called zero-touch infection. Zero-click infection. You didn't have to click on anything to get infected. They just had to know your number. They had to know who you were. And if they did that, I could exploit your phone. Think about how creepy that is to the fact is that you don't even have to do anything. 
and we were just talking about this with one of the guys from Zimperium. It's mobile. How many people do not, in this day and age, have a mobile device? We've all got them, right? So we all live our lives on them. How many people do their banking on them? How many of you guys keep your phones on them? If you travel, what else do you have to keep on them now? Proof of vaccination if you're going out of the country, you know, things like that. We have now changed to where this has now become the center, basically, of our lives. When I was first doing computer forensics, get probably the same thing as you. A lot of it was laptops, desktops. You know, you take hard drives out. First hard drive I analyzed was a 40 megabyte hard drive. With DOS, I think it was 3.3, so you could partition it into a 32 meg C drive and an 8 megabyte D drive. And I thought, that is wicked awesome. I got a D drive, right? I could, I could analyze it by looking at the screen, right? Not anymore. Um, the first lunar, uh, the first Apollo that landed on the moon, how big was the processor? Is a 384K, yeah, 88, reduced instruction set computer. 384K was all it needed to land on the moon. Three, think about that, because to, to go to space and come back, you only need to solve two problems, how to take off and how to get back safely, but you don't do the second one until, you don't do the first one until you've solved for the second one, right? No sense in launching and going, now how do we get back? That's, that's a failed strategy, right? But now, the average phone, how many gigabytes does it have on it? How many applications does it have on it? How much, you know, how fast is the processor? So what's, what is now becoming the prime target to get into a corporate environment? Because you trust this thing, don't you? You carry it everywhere. Don't tell me you carry it in the shower, Derek. Always? <laughs> Dude. <laughs> there's, there's, you check with your company. I think they have, you know, services available for that. But, but you know, we, we take this everywhere we go, right? So what's the easiest vector to get in? Is to have you open up something on your phone. Have you something to do on this, right, to get back into your corporate environment? So all I wanted to do today was just kind of tell you some stories. Yeah, I, I don't want to do slides. Um, it's not that I don't mind doing them, but, you know, what I found is more effective is to get to challenge your thinking is not have you watching something back here, but have you really focus and say, what is it you're doing today that if I were an attacker, I could change, I could challenge, I could go after Get into your system, right? What's the vulnerability? And the vulnerability, uh, last story here before we close out, um, I used to run Microsoft's anti-piracy program for them. I did all their internet investigations of pirated software. And I was at, long, uh, I was at Building 8 Long Corporate Affairs in uh, Redmond, Washington. Now, it's funny. I didn't realize it at the time because uh, this was like 1999, uh, uh, and I was booking travel, and so you had to use a travel agent to do that. They didn't have all the, you know, online stuff, and I said, I need to go to Redmond. Well, I landed in Redmond, Oregon, not Redmond, Washington. And she goes, oh, you're another one of those. So they had a lot of people landing in Redmond, Oregon, and so I had to get a quick flight, get to Redmond, Washington. Well, I get there, and the bet was with the guy, he's like, you can't get into the building. I said, I'll meet you in the second floor conference, and we'd been there before. He said, you can't get in. You have to have a badge. You have to have a lanyard. You know, you have to have to do all that stuff. I said, okay. I said, here's the deal. If I can get in without having, without being challenged, without being stopped, will double the price of my invoice. Well, he wasn't, so it's like, if you're really sure, right, take the bet. He wasn't sure. I said, well, let's just do it anyway. So you know what I had? I had a collection of things in my bag. What did I have a collection in my bag of? So what I sat was I sat and I, for 30 minutes, I watched everybody who came into Microsoft. And you know what the things like, what? So let me ask you, let me walk you through this kind of thing. What would I be looking for? That must be the bullshit meter. It's gone off a couple more times. <laughs> I was in Vegas, and the fire alarm was going off uh, one time during a speech. So if I want to get into long corporate affairs, building aid in Microsoft, and I'm going to sit there for 30 minutes, what are the things I'm looking for? Ma'am. How they're dressed, how they talk, their manner, you know, and how they enter, right? What's important about how they enter? More than that, dig deeper. The distracted, no, there was no pin code, it was just, just a badge. You just badge your way in, right? What else am I looking for? Yeah, do they, do they leave the door open? Do they close it, right? So let's assume that they close it behind them, but I still need to get in. So you guys, you guys aren't digging deep enough. Think, I just gave you the clue. What else am I looking for? Well, I'm looking at their badge, at their lanyards. I'm looking at where do they care, where does Microsoft carry their badge, and what orientation is their badge? Is it portrait or is it landscape? And does it are they on pulleys, are they on lanyards, and how do they do it? So what do I have a collection of in my bag? 
Badges. Badges, we don't need no stinking badges. By the way, another piece of trivia. Where's the movie that really came from? No? No, badges, so many of you might have heard. Um, no, no, not the Three Amigos. Uh, remember the, the, the great uh, Blazing Saddles, right? It actually, came, it actually came from Harvey Bogart's Treasure of the Sierra Madre. That's where the original badges, we don't need new badges, came from. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking at their badge. What's the orientation? How do they wear it? What do they do? And I look for, do they allow people to walk behind them? And what I saw was several people would start to go up and badge. The other person would say, let me get that for you, and they would badge and let them in. All I did was wait. Got me a badge that kind of looked like. So what I did is I kind of flipped it over because most on the back of everybody's badge is kind of standard writing, right? You know, see. So I had it flipped around. So I'm like, okay. So I went to go up and she started going. I said, here, I started going. She got her badge there first. She said, let me get that for you. I opened the door and I just walked in right behind her. Because the other thing you have to do is act like you own the damn place. You, so you just walk in. This is how Kev, Kevin Mitnick was good technically. Kevin was a much better social engineer than he was a technical person because he thought differently about the problem. So that's the last story. Uh, any quick questions before we turn you guys loose and uh, before I turn this back over to Kim? Oh, well, actually, let me just finish talking about the NSO um, Pegasus stuff real quick, because here's what was unique about that. If I wanted to sell a nuclear missile, would we be able to probably tell that one of our nuclear missiles is missing from a Minuteman silo, you Air Force people? Yeah, you'd hope so, right? It's, nuclear missiles are kind of hard to duplicate if you lose one. You know, it, it's a bad thing, but we kind of track those things. How easy is it to copy software? So once these tools get into the wild, even with Pegasus, even with NSO, as good as that stuff is, once that gets out there, people start taking it from its original intended purpose, which was intelligence operations, which, by the way, guys, we do this all the time. We, we, have, we have proxies. We have third parties who get into systems for us because we need plausible deniability. But once that software gets out there, then it starts being used for another thing. So right now, we're, it looks like uh, Saudi Arabia used it on Kamal Khashoggi to target him. Mexico, actually, it's been found being used in Mexico to target people who are uh, against the uh, soda tax, or that they want a soda tax because they want to stop the amount of sugar in soda. And so the soda industry has been using this same software to target the anti-tax people or the tax people down in Mexico. So now we're getting to the point of where the software is getting out there. It means anybody can be targeted for any reason. And zero touch infection, I mean, that's scary. That's like coming home and stuff disappears out of your house because uh, Star Trek, Jim Kirk teleported into your house, took it, and then teleported back out, and there's no, there's no evidence of entry or exit. I mean, that's how scary this stuff is getting. So any quick questions before we turn this back over to Kim and turn you guys loose? Anybody want to challenge anything I said called BS? I'm, I'm okay with that. Anybody worried about what's coming next? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that was the previous speaker talked about $20 billion lost uh, in 2020 for uh, ransomware. Up from 11.5, I think it was. See, I pay attention. I just don't come to, these to look pretty and wear a suit, you know. Yeah, Kip just said one of his favorite models is question the assumptions, right? Because if you trust the underlying assumptions, then you have to agree with the end result. Question the assumptions. I mean, how do you know? I had a reporter ask me one time, said, does your mother love you? I said, yes. He goes, how do you know? I said, well, that's a stupid question to ask. But it got the point home, right? It's, okay, we're going to do this because this is what happens if we don't. Well, how do you know? You know, how do you know that's assumptions correct? So... Hey, guys, I'm going to be around, I think, till 1 o'clock. i got a car coming to pick me up. i got to go back to the airport. So if you have any questions, I'll be around until then. So I, I hope you guys at least challenged you a little bit, challenged your thinking. You guys enjoyed the time, made you think differently about this. And remember, it's not about responding anymore. We've got to change our terminology to how do we stop this from happening and how do we extract a price from these attackers and make it extremely economically difficult to attack us uh, anymore. So thank you, guys. We'll talk to you later. Okay, thank you, Morgan. So that one person out there that said that he was not going to attend because Morgan was from Fox News missed out, right?